Welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the second isomorphism theorem. Now, this video is intended to follow the video on uh, the product of two subgroups, so it's necessary to have watched that video or be familiar with the content of that video uh, before watching this video. Okay, right. So, firstly, let me just begin with the setup then. So what we're going to have then is some group capital G, okay, and we're going to have two subgroups of this group capital G. So we'll have A and B, which are both subgroups of the group capital G. Now, uh, for what we're going to do, for the second isomorphism theorem to work, we do not need our group, nor do we need our subgroups A and B to be finite uh, at all, okay? This will work in the infinite case as well, okay? So this is just an arbitrary group with two subgroups A and B here. Okay, now we are going to assume that A is going to be contained within the normalizer of B in G, okay? So that when we product A and B together, when we take the product of these two subgroups, as we learned to do in the previous video, entitled the product of two subgroups, we will end up with a subgroup of G. So we saw in the previous video that if A is contained within the normalizer of B and G, then you can conclude that the product of the two subgroups will in fact be a subgroup itself of the group capital G. So this is all stuff from the previous video. Now let me actually state the new stuff, the second isomorphism theorem. So I'll just put an additional little title here. So for short, I'll call this the second iso theorem, like so. So here is the second isomorphism theorem then. Okay, so firstly, uh, I just need to point two things out before I can actually state the second isomorphism theorem. Two things that I didn't point out in the previous video on the product of two subgroups. Okay, and that is that B the subgroup B will be a subgroup within uh, the product of the two subgroups A and B, and it will actually end up being a normal subgroup of AB. Okay? In addition, the intersection of these two, A intersect B, this will actually end up being a normal subgroup within A. Okay, and don't worry, we will prove these things in just a moment. Now, the statement then of the second isomorphism theorem is, okay, I can quotient out the product of these two subgroups, the product of A and B, out by B, because it's a normal subgroup of A times B, okay, and the second isomorphism theorem says that this is isomorphic to what you get if you quotient A out by the normal subgroup that is A intersect B. Okay, so there, that... Um, line there, that isomorphism, that of course is what you would call the second isomorphism theorem, that AB quotiented out by B is isomorphic to A quotiented out by A intersect B. Okay, and if you're intimidated by the look of this at the moment, don't be. It is really, really simple, and if you've understood the video on the product of two subgroups, then you will have no problems at all in understanding why this is true. Okay, it looks intimidating at the moment, but it's not. Okay, right, so to try and understand this, and once we understand it, it will be very, very simple, and what this means, um, let me just draw a picture. Okay, so let's draw a picture of our group capital G here. Okay, so here, uh, this will be our entire group, capital G, and I will colour our entire group in in green, okay, or rather outline this in green here. And then of course I need to mark on my two subgroups A and B here, so I'll start by marking on uh, the subgroup B, so we'll have the subgroup B down here, so this can be B, and it's a little bit bigger than I intended to make it, but never mind. Okay, so here is B, like so, in orange. Okay, now let me put A on here, so now let's have A here, okay? Uh, so I'll colour A in in red. And of course A intersect B will then just be this box where uh, the two of them overlap, okay? And of course we know that they will have a non-empty intersection because they are both subgroups uh, and the intersection of two subgroups is always a subgroup at the very least, it'll always contain the identity element. Okay, right. So let's just remind ourselves of what we mean by the product of A and B. So remember, this just consists of all elements of the set capital A composed with all elements of the set capital B. So all things of the form little a composed with little b, where little a is from capital A and little b is from capital B. But the most 
helpful way to view it is that actually it's a union of loads of left cosets of B. Okay, so what you need to do here is union together loads of left cosets of B, all the left cosets generated by elements of the set capital A here. Okay, and in terms of the picture, what that means is we know we can partition the entire group up into left cosets of B. Okay, and I'll make these uh, look smaller than uh, actual B here so that we've got a um, sensible number in there. I know they don't all look the same size, that can't be helped because I may be stupidly big here. Okay, but I want to have six in there to get the point across, okay, uh, credibly. Okay, so here I have partitioned my group capital G up into the left cosets of B here, okay, and there are six of them in this case. And to construct then the product of A and B, what you have to do is you have to go through these cosets, and the ones that actually have elements of A in them, so B obviously has elements of A in them, it, and this one will have elements of A, and this one as well, and this one as well. You union all of those together, so the product of A and B will look like this square here. All of the cosets, the left cosets of B, which contain elements of capital A. Okay, so there's the nice interpretation of uh, the product of A and B. So what I'm now saying is that B will be a normal subgroup in A, B, and I'll show you why in just a moment. We can then quotient this uh, product of these two subgroups out by B, and of course we'll just partition it up into these cosets here, and the cosets will now become the elements of this quotient group, and this is just stating that this will be isomorphic to what you would get if you quotiented A here out by A intersect B. Okay, which we'll have to prove is a normal subgroup of A. But looking at this picture, I hope you agree that that is very much so believable, because this is just, if you like, these cosets made smaller. The, each of these cosets that is in here clipped a little bit down to just the elements that are in A. Okay, but it's believable from the picture. So that's the thing that I want to start off with, just the explanation as to how this is reasonably intuitive, how this is a believable statement. Okay, and I hope that that picture has done that for you. Okay, so let's start with the proof then now. Okay, so let's uh, firstly prove that B is indeed going to be a normal subgroup within the product of A and B. Okay, so this is very simple. Um, we know that A is in the normalizer of B in G. We needed it to be in the normalizer of B in G in order for the product of A and B, this subgroup product, to actually be a subgroup. But what I also know is that B is always going to be in the normalizer of B in G, okay? Because B is a subgroup. So if I, you know, if I um, conjugate B by any element in B, I do always get B back again. Any element of the subgroup will conjugate that subgroup to give the subgroup back again, okay? So B is always going to be in its own normalizer, trivially, okay? But now the normalizer of B in G is a subgroup of G, okay? So it's going to be closed under composition. It contains all of the elements of capital A. It contains all of the elements of capital B. So it's going to contain all of the elements of the product of A and B. Because remember, all of the elements of the product of A and B are just everything in A composed with everything in B. So if this is going to be closed, it must contain the entire product of A and B. Okay, so this will be contained within the normalizer of B in G. But now that means that B is going to be normal inside uh, the product of A with B. Okay, the reason being that B is normal inside its normalizer. That's why this is called the normalizer of B and G. It's the largest subgroup of G in which B is a normal subgroup. Okay, because whatever element you take here, by definition, it will conjugate B to give B. Okay, so certainly in this subgroup of the normalizer of B and G, B is going to be normal, i.e. whatever element of this that we use to conjugate B, uh, we will get B back again. So indeed, B is going to be a normal subgroup of A uh, multiplied with B. Okay, excellent. Uh, so that then means that I can successfully take the product of A and B and quotient it out by B. I am perfectly entitled to do this. Okay, and of course, what I will get is very, very simple. I will just take this product of A and B and partition it up into these cosets of B, left cosets or the right cosets, they'll be identical. We might as well interpret it as left cosets, because we've already done that. Okay, so you'll just get these cosets here, and those will now be the elements of this 
um, new algebraic structure that we're creating here, this new group, and the composition will, law will work in the way that we've seen many times by studying quotient groups. You'll take a representative from each of the two cosets, compose them together in the initial group, and then take the coset that contains the answer. Okay, so you can construct this thing. What I now want to try and do, obviously, is prove the second isomorphism theorem. I want to try and connect this to A quotiented out by A intersect B. And the best way to do this is not so directly as you would imagine. Okay, the best way to do it is to set up a fairly intuitive um, group homomorphism and then just apply the first isomorphism theorem, and it all works beautifully. So approaching it not so directly is the best uh, way to do this. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to establish this group homomorphism, which as usual I'll call phi here, okay, which is going to map the subgroup capital A, which is a group, okay, onto this quotient group, which is AB quotient out by B. Okay, and we're going to do this in a very intuitive way. We're going to map any element little a in the uh, subgroup capital A onto the coset that contains it, A bar here. Okay, and that is an utterly well-defined map, okay, because this will just consist of these cosets that we've got here, and we know that all of the cosets here will have to contain an element of uh, the subgroup capital A because of the way this was defined. It was defined just as the union of the cosets of B, the left cosets of B in G, uh, that contained elements of capital A here. Okay, so all of the cosets in here will contain elements of capital A. Okay, so every element of the capital A can be sent onto the coset that contains it. That's a perfectly well-defined map. Okay, it's not necessarily injective. There might be loads of elements that are all going to be sent onto the same coset. So in this picture here, look, in this little box here, this portion of this coset of B, there might be loads of elements of capital A inside that, okay, which will therefore, under this mapping, all be sent onto the same coset in this quotient group. So it's not necessarily injective at all, uh, but it is going to be a well-defined map. Okay, and it's certainly going to be subjective. Every single coset here will have an element of capital A being mapped onto it. Okay, so what I can say about this is that it's subjective. I also claim that it's a group homomorphism, so let's just discuss why it's a group homomorphism. Okay, so we're going to have to show the homomorphism property then. Okay, which is that, um, well, actually, I'll write it out in full. For all, let's say, little a1 and little a2 you can possibly dream up from capital A, it must be the case that if we consider phi of a1 composed with a2, where this is composition in the subgroup capital A and therefore in the initial group capital G, okay, so I'll color code this in. So this is composition in uh, capital A, or in capital G, if you'd rather view it that way, because of course composition in A is the same as composition in G, okay? Uh, and we want to prove that this is going to be equal to phi of A1, so firstly map A1 onto which coset it is going to be mapped onto in the quotient group, composed in the quotient group, so I'll now have that denoted in orange, so composition in the quotient group, AB quotiented out by B, will be denoted in orange here, uh, with, of course, the image of A2, phi of A2 here. Okay, so this is what I want to prove is true. Okay, so I'll put a little question mark here. Right, so how am I going to do this? Well, I'm just going to apply the definition. So phi of A1 composed with A2, well, this will just be the coset that contains that answer, A1 composed with A2. So compose the two of them together, you'll get something in capital A, take the coset that contains the answer. Okay? So that's still composition in capital A here. Okay, here on the other hand, uh, phi of A1 will just be the coset that contains A1, and then we'll be composing it in the quotient group with the coset that contains A2, which is just what phi of A2 is equal to. So this is composition in the quotient group. But then what's the definition of composition in the quotient group? You take a representative from here, you take a representative from here, uh, compose them together in the initial group, and then take the coset that contains the answer. We know that it's well defined from our study of quotient groups long, long ago. Okay, so it really does does not matter which representative you take, so we might as well take the representative A1 from here and the representative A2 from here, we'll compose them together in the initial group, which is the same as composition in A, so if you like, do think of that as composition in the group capital G, okay? Um, 
and then take the closet that contains the answer, but of course that's what we've got over here. So there is our path to proving this. So I can now tick that. Uh, the group homomorphism is satisfied, okay? Uh, it is a group homomorphism. The group homomorphism property is satisfied. Okay, right. Uh, so that's because of the way that quotient groups are defined, because of the very intuitive way that quotient groups are defined, that that is achieved. Okay, so we now have this group homomorphism uh, from the uh, subgroup capital A onto this quotient group, which maps all of the elements that are in the same coset of B uh, onto the same coset. It maps every element onto uh, what element over here, which coset over here that element is contained in. Okay, so what we're now going to do is apply the first isomorphism theorem of groups, okay, which says that this domain group quotiented out by the codomain, uh, sorry, quotiented out by the kernel of the group homomorphism is isomorphic to the image of this group homomorphism, and because it's subjective, the image is just the entire quotient group here. So firstly, let's just ask, what is going to be the kernel of this group homomorphism? What is the kernel of phi? Well, that's going to be all elements in capital A that will be mapped onto the identity coset here. Now, the identity coset is just uh, the subgroup B, that contains the identity element from the original group, and that forms the identity coset in this quotient group here. Okay, so it's going to be all the elements of A that are also in B, so it's going to be A intersect B, and that now proves that A intersect B will be a normal subgroup in capital A, because we know that always the kernel of a group homomorphism is a normal subgroup. So there's the proof that A intersect B is a normal subgroup inside A, done indirectly in this way. And now what we know by the first isomorphism theorem, so I'll just write this down, so by the first iso theorem, okay, we can conclude that the domain group A, quotiented out by the kernel of the group homomorphism, which is A intersect B, is isomorphic to the image of the group homomorphism, which is the entire quotient group AB quotiented out by B. Okay, so the first, uh, sorry, the second isomorphism theorem is proved via the first isomorphism theorem very nicely in this way. Of course, you didn't have to use the first isomorphism theorem, but this is a very handy way of using the first isomorphism theorem in order to prove the second isomorphism theorem. So I hope that that theorem is very intuitive to you and that you also understand now the rigorous proof uh, of it via establishing this very natural uh, group homomorphism from the subgroup A onto the quotient group of AB quotiented out by B.